Thank you, Robert. Is this good? How does this sound, everyone? Good? Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for having me, and uh, thanks to Robert, who I now realize is a fellow Virginian. Uh, Robert grew up in, uh, well, spent first, his first eight years in Charlottesville, which is um, just 90, min uh, 90 minutes, 90 miles. Um, an hour and 10 minutes actually north of Lynchburg. So I'm happy to be here with a fellow Virginian and talking about the Blue Ridge Parkway, which I'm gonna go back to this weekend. So that's good, good times. Um, also want to say, uh, I hope you all don't mind being Hartford folks that my presentation is about New Haven. And I know how Hartford and New Haven talk or don't talk to each other. So I hope you find this interesting and don't throw um, tomatoes at me if you say enough with New Haven. We want to hear about Hartford and World War One. This is um, about how the university and the city uh, worked together and its legacy in the year 1917. In the summer of 1917, after less than three months of training, at Camp Yale on the grounds around the Yale Bowl on the western edge of the city of New Haven, Connecticut, a farewell program was organized for the departing soldiers of the 102nd Regiment, the first time such an evening event had been held in the bowl. Newspapers reported on the event the next day, calling it the most unique night event that has ever been seen out of doors in New Haven or this state. 50,000 Connecticut residents and departing soldiers were treated to a seven-act vaudeville and musical performance where a perfect fairyland of electricity created one of the most remarkable and indescribable pictures possible. After the circus-like acts and the playing of the Star Spangled Banner by the 102nd Regiment Band, the soldiers and some sailors as well stood up and marched across the green grass that carpets the bowl out into the street that led to their stations. According to the newspaper, the cheers of farewell that greeted them nearly drowned out the playing of the great band. This summer of 1917 changed everything for the United States. As of April, Americans were officially allied participants in the Great War, and as of June, the Selective Service, or draft, was enlisting men into regiments such as the 102nd. Preparations to enter the Western Front in France were in full force, and cantonments and camps sprang up around the country, making doughboys out of farmhands, clerks, factory workers, and college students. New Haven, Connecticut was one such active place home to the Winchester Repeating Arms Manufacturing Company, maker of the M1917 Enfield and the Model 1918 Browning Automatic Rifle, home to Yale University, the third oldest institution of higher learning in the country, and now also home to the newly formed 102nd Regiment of the 26th Yankee Division of the U.S. Army. New Haven has had a sometimes productive sometimes difficult relationship with the Ivy League school over the course of its 300-year history, which included fistfights and rioting between town and gown, especially during the 19th century, reaching a low point in 1854 when a Yale student shot a New Haven firefighter during a fight. But beginning in 1917, with the force of the statewide preparedness movement, city and university began to work together in ways never before seen. On the home front, at least for the time being, the Great War helped to break down social, economic, and political barriers that had grown exponentially in the previous century, when the city was becoming ever more diverse and the university ever more elitist. As mentioned, in 1917, the 102nd made their first camp on the grounds of Yale Field in the shadow of the Yale Bowl, with Yale students and professors enlisting in various arms of the military, including the Yankee Division, along with New Haveners and New Englanders. Iconic places such as the New Haven Green, Yale's old campus, and the University Dining Hall became centers for publicly visible wartime 
preparations. In this work, the revival of the spirit of 1776, a sentiment expressed by Thomas Jefferson and many others to give name to the self-determination and liberty codified in the Declaration of Independence in 1917, served to unite town and gown with a common identity that would break down divisions part and parcel of American society. Divisions that were clearly seen in the lives of townies versus gownies. The spirit of 76, an idea later revived during the country's centennial in 1876, was a national one, but could also be applied in the regional, in regional and local contexts. Something that Connecticut, as one of the 13 original colonies and one of, five, one of the five small New England states, could utilize. Thus, figures such as the Defenders Monument and the Nathan Hale Monument. Hale, as you know, um, is considered America's first spy who, in legend, was said to have uttered the words, my only regret is that I have but one life to give to my country. These figures instilled a local and national sense of identity dating back to the American Revolution and the iconic year of 1776, the year the Declaration of Independence was written, signed, and read aloud and in print across the colonies, and also the year, by the way, that Hale was hanged by the British. The bronze Nathan Hale Monument had been installed only four years earlier on Yale's old campus, but the figure of a Connecticut farm boy slash university student slash school teacher slash soldier spy remains a focal point of university life even today although few remember the ways in which the spirit of 76 was revived locally during World War I. Even fewer recognize, recognize the Defenders Monument and the reach of history in which the figure of a farmer, a Yale student, and a militiaman defend the city from the enemy, a visual reminder of wartime cooperation during the World War I years. This paper suggests that by looking at sites of communal significance for town and gown in 1917, as both prepared to enter wartime Europe under the aegis of the spirit of 76, we can see how different people across New Haven were able to unite in their work. The paper concludes, though, with a problematic legacy, much as the legacy of World War I led not to a lasting peace, but eventually to a violence spread from one side of the world to the other in World War II. The robust relationship between town and gown in 1917 in New Haven would also not last, breaking down in violence. New Haven, Connecticut retains some of its early characteristics today as it possessed in 1917, and even much earlier than that, going back to its 17th century origins. The small city on Long Island Sound, halfway between New York City and Boston, was from the very beginning an ecclesiastical city of churches, education, and commerce a triumvirate described clearly in this commemorative medal made for the city's second centennial in 1838. New Haven was founded by English Puritans who believed their chosen settlement site was blessed by God himself. The first Church of Christ, or more informally Center Church, whose spire anchors the design of the medal, touching the heavenly sky, is the very center of the city's famous nine square plan which you can see in this map drawn in 1747, which to this day remains a sacred, central sacred space around which the city revolves, with city hall, municipal and county courthouses, the main library, commerce, and Yale University located all along its green squared edges. And here on the map, uh, which is really squished, you can see here, right, this is the squished green, that center church, here's the graveyard, here's Yale College, and here are three cannons that were located on the green originally. Over the course of its existence, the New Haven Green, the center square of the nine square plan, has been many things, as I showed you. It was a graveyard, it was an animal pasture, it was a marketplace for agricultural goods, including the sale of human beings. It was a parade route for holidays, from date, going from Columbus to St. Patrick. It was a concert venue, it still is. It's a memorializing site and a protest site, 
And from the very beginning, it's a, it was a space for military musters, parades, and even the placement of cannon, as we saw on the last slide. But by the turn of the 20th century, this military use of the city's most public space had long fallen out of favor for other green spaces within the city, such as Grapevine Point and Bayview Park, both in use during the last great conflict on the home front, which was, of course, the American Civil War. World War I reactivated the New Haven Green militarily, becoming a primary public spectacle which demonstrated both town and gown dedication to wartime efforts. By 1917, the New Haven Green was once again alive to the spirit of 76. Using the green, even the area to the right, of, right next to Center Church, as you can see in the image on the lower in the right, by the way, those cannons are firing over the graves of people. You can see that this is surely, the use of the green is a form of propaganda for the city as city residents, students, and the workforce that traveled in and out of New Haven via trolley cars, trains, and even automobiles would see these things every day. As the New Haven Register reported in the December 9, 1917 issue, the Central Green has become the drill ground for the city. Yale is taking a huge part in this work. Several tents were put up on the green to, quote, inspire the people of the city with an appreciation of the fact that the men of the nation were being called to its defense. Although New Haven had an urban core by 1917, there were plenty of other green spaces around the edges of the city and a city park system which could have been utilized. Therefore, the choice to use the green was much more than just the ease of location. It was a political and social statement. Inside Center Church, pastors gave recruitment Sunday sermons, while outside the church, Walter Camp, the father of American football and the Yale director of athletics, designed a 90-day exercise regimen for men between the ages of 45 and 60 in order to, quote, fit older men for work that will release their juniors to the front. Not surprisingly, an army recruitment office was located close by on Chapel Street, and thus within a few short months, it was as if the defenders of New Haven had stepped off of their bronzed base, bonding together over a common enemy. The spirit of 1776 was put to use again in 1917. As suggested, New Haven was primed to appreciate not only the spectacle of such sights, but also to accept and further the coming together of town and gown in the war effort. Public art in the form of parade, performances, prints, and the installation of bronze monuments reshaped town and gown attitudes that were often sour, if not outwardly hostile, in the previous century. Before Nathan Hale was installed on Yale's old campus in 1913, the city of New Haven had erected the Defenders Monument two years previous. Although mostly forgotten today, the Defenders Monument is really a story about the revival of the spirit of 1776, the spirit of patriotism and liberty through cooperation, specifically New Haven, the cooperation between town and gown. The monument depicts three men loading a cannon aimed at stopping the British invasion of New Haven. This was one of the long-standing New Haven legends about the American Revolution, which had stuck around for more than 125 years, and by the 1910s, these local legends were getting the bronze treatment. The monuments, such as Nathan Hale and Defenders, point to the relationship between town and gown after the turn of the 20th century, when America the melting pot took in millions of immigrants and New Haven itself had changed considerably due to the influx of the Irish, Italians, Poles, and Hungarians, among others. The city, in fact, had its first Irish mayor in 1899 and would have its first Jewish mayor during the war years of 1917-1918. Some may read the installation of these bronze monuments as a way to hold on to white Protestant culture that was coming under pressure from the new people. But on the other hand, these bronzes also represent the idealization of town and gown working together, both in the sense of the actual commissioning process and as a bandage to lingering problems of the previous century. 
In support of this statement, one of the agents behind both the Defenders and the Nathan Hale Monument commissions was a non yale named George Dudley Seymour. Some of you know him <laughs> very well. Although Seymour himself was not a Yale alum, he was a patent lawyer with an interest in all things historical. His cousin, Charles Seymour, was president of the university, and George Dudley Seymour believed that town and gown were better served if they worked more closely together. Towards this end, Seymour worked on small ideas and big ones, advocating to Yale that its art gallery should be open on Sundays to make it easier for working class New Haveners to visit, as well as hiring the well-known landscape architects Frederick Law Olmsted and the architect Cass Gilbert to work on a citywide urban redesign that would create better connections between institutions, city green spaces, transportation hubs, and the people they served. The spirit of 76 was revived across the United States in 1917, as seen in these images, with a role to play on both the home front and the western front. Soldiers from the Yankee division painted insignia on their Brody helmets that referenced the American Revolution, while the American public saw hundreds of propaganda images of Lady Liberty, Uncle Sam, and once again the spirit of 76 in their everyday lives while going to market or to the bank. And as we've seen, they've dressed as the spirit of 76 in parades in 1917 and sang patriotic songs published by Tin Pan Alley in New York City. It's no surprise then that with the commencement in the late spring of 1917, that Yale College had put on its program cover not images of students in their caps and gowns, nor Yale's storied architecture, but a picture of Doughboy standing next to the Nathan Hale Monument. The spirit of 76 worked and has always worked on the American mind and attitude. This is why political groups, even well into the 21st century, such as the Tea Party and its use of the historic Gadsden Don't Tread on Me flag, reference the American Revolution and its easily digestible idea of liberty as a currency because these sentiments are embedded very deeply in American culture. But how long did this feeling of town and gown cooperation exist during, World War I, during the World War I era? Although we might automatically think or hope that the legacy of 1917, of a year in which New Haveners and Yaleys crossed boundary lines and became one force, continued on, allowing town and gown to work for the good of the whole, this was not the case. In the recent three-part documentary, America in the Great War, on the American Experience, the PBS station, which I'm sure many of you saw, uh, which was, as you say, shown in April during Centennial Week, filmmakers noted that though the war had ended successfully for the Allies, and even more so for the Americans, who had proved their worth on the battlefield, tensions and anxieties remained intact on the home front, leading to a resurgence in antagonistic behaviors between different groups of Americans, especially and most visibly in race riots. This was due partly, the document, documentary suggested, to the deep suspicions and distrust Americans felt towards each other, exacerbated during the war years thanks to President Woodrow Wilson's shutdown of free speech. Anyone who dared to publicly or even privately speak against the war suffered. Wilson's administration put into place a series of impactful laws, first the Espionage Act of 1917, and then the Sedition Act of 1918, which were aimed at oppressing free speech, the antithesis to an open and democratic society, and the very things the United States claimed to be fighting for across an ocean. Thus, after our mistress and the return of Doughboys to the United States, places like Washington, D.C., more than 25 other American cities were embroiled in race riots during the so-called Red Summer of 1919. The spirit of 1776, 1917, therefore, took a hit both nationally and locally. New Haven, Connecticut did not see these race riots but a resurgence in something that had been put to bed in 1917 came back full on. Antagonism between town and gown reared its ugly head 
on of all days, this day, the homecoming parade of the 102nd Regiment to New Haven. Yale professor and historian Roland Osterweiss calls May 24, 1919, quote, one of the most tragic incidents in New Haven history, end quote. Although Osterweiss, writing in 1942, says that it is impossible to report on the full facts of the incident from what he had gathered, as veteran troops paraded past the Yale campus, an exchange of insults took place with the soldiers calling the students slackers and the students calling the soldiers tin soldiers. But this wasn't the end of it. Over the course of the weekend, people were getting more agitated and two nights later, townies stated that they heard Yale students hissing at the 102nd Regiment Band, who you can see playing in the parade, who was then playing, they were then playing at Polize Palace Theater. The next day, the New Haven Union printed the notice, quote, it is said that plans have been made to have the servicemen gather at the Bennett Fountain on the New Haven Green at eight o'clock tonight, and from there it is claimed they intend to proceed to campus, end quote. In fact, 5,000 New Haveners marched to campus, but the university was already on lockdown, and the group, which included 300 returned veterans, resorted to breaking windows and beating up unsuspecting males found in the street. The group tried to return the next night for another round of vandalism and brutality, but they were dispersed by armed platoons of state guardsmen with fire trucks and hoses at the ready. Although Osterweiss tries to downplay the division of town and gown in 1919 as an unfortunate deviation from the normal trend, assigning blame to the pent-up emotions of people who had just passed through a trying, the trying experience of a world war. If we look to find the spirit of 1776-1917 in 1919 and after in New Haven, the sentiment is gone. Yale University, growing in size in the 1920s and 30s, always included gates to keep town and gown separate. These gates remain shut and locked to townies to this day. To further the division and pushing aside the spirit of 1776-1917, town and gown erected separate monuments to the Great War in the succeeding decades. Yale was the first entity in New Haven to erect a monument to World War I, choosing a cenotaph for Hewlett Quadrangle with inscriptions of the major American battle sites above resting on the entablature of Yale Dining Hall with the building which had, during wartime, served the New Haven chapter of the American Red Cross. The city followed suit in 1929 with a memorial flagpole on the New Haven Green, its base inscribed with the same French battle site names. Neither monument makes note of the other. If one were to read the history of New Haven and World War I from these two central monuments, the relationship between town and gown during wartime would not be known. But one marker does exist in the most out of the way, difficult place to access that reminds us of town gown cooperation during World War I, and not surprisingly, it was erected during World War II by veterans themselves. It is likely the concrete tablet was placed here to remember that Derby Avenue was the street that members of the 102nd Regiment used for marching between New Haven Green and Camp Yale. But today, the road is dangerously fast, is used only really by dangerously fast moving cars as an access route into the city, discouraging walking on the dusty streets, and further, there is no parking lot, nor is there a sign to let anyone know that this marker and its accompanying always empty flagpole are there. Like the spirit of 1776, 1917, the memory of town gown cooperation during wartime especially important for World War I, when the United States entered the world stage, has been forgotten. Although townies and gownies no longer fist fight or shoot each other, they also do not come together to remember their shared heritage, nor that special night in August of 1917 when everyone came together under the electric lights of the Yale Bowl. The centennial of 1917 this year is a good time to do this. 
Thank you. That is my proper talk. And this is a slide just showing um, some of the stories that are in the book, uh, New Haven in World War I. I have a few copies with me. If you have any questions about the presentation or about the book, please do ask now. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a good question, and in fact, yes. Um, the bulk of my research from this, for this book um, took place at the New Haven Public Library because they have clippings folders from the years 1916 to 1918. And so I filtered a lot of my material through the clippings done by librarians of the time period. And there were a couple of clippings, and I did work them into um, a chapter of the book, which is indicated that, yes, the Red Scare did exist also in New Haven, or I should say an enemy alien scare existed in New Haven, so that there were, was apparently a map created of the city which outlined areas that um, designated folks who were probably New Haveners and worked in the factories that they were not allowed to go near, which were, of course, the manufacturing sites. I have not found that map. Last night at the New Haven Museum, I said, you know, you guys really need to look for this map because it would be a fascinating uh, look into it. And um, there was mention of um, factory workers at Winchester turning in other, uh, uh, their colleagues um, to, if they're on a list or not kind of idea. So yes, I think that did happen in New Haven too. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. At Yale? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, I, I'm not going to profess to be a Yale historian, um, but from my reading, uh, Yale enters the preparedness movement very early, much earlier than the city does, and earlier probably than the state in terms of being interested in actually going over. So Yale students immediately start leaving university in 1915 and 1916 themselves. They leave university and go and join um, ambulance Corps, um, aviation corps um, before the Americans are involved. So that's happening. And then Yale itself jumps on really quickly and an ROTC program begins with very formal structures of the classes that um, these uh, new uh, soldiers have to take. So the, the university seems like it's, it's jumped in with both feet um, in a big way. It didn't. The, the university kept going. Yeah. Um, I don't know how that compares to World War II. And someone asked me last night a similar question, which is, what's the, what was the percentage of Yale students who actually, and I, I don't know that number. 